Welcome um, everybody back here to the Siegel Talks at the Martini Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center, CUNY at the City University of New York in Manhattan. And it's uh, another day on planet Earth, another week, uh, another week during lockdown, uh, another week uh, where we uh, try to make sense uh, uh, out of uh, the world, what we do, what we have been doing, what we should be doing, what we should not be doing. And um, yeah, it's uh, perhaps a different landscape. David Burns famous song, so it's like stop making sense, but perhaps it's Jenny Bass, the great rock musician and also host uh, of, of uh, music, talks with musicians. She says, maybe we have to start making sense again and um, one of the ways to find meaning, to understand better where we are, where we come from, where we're going to is of course, to listen uh, to artists, to theater artists, but to really uh, listen. And this is a time where we can really listen. And it's also a time to think. And uh, we have been forced uh, to slow down. So nature's way of uh, saying, uh, uh, this is uh, serious, take a break and we, or as we said yesterday, kind of like when a car that is a full brake is up in the air, we don't know, not know, do we land on the four wheels? Will it be a catastrophic crash? Uh, but something will be different. We are still in the middle of it in the trenches. And uh, that is why it is important. We have to listen to artists and we also have to listen to the leaders in our field in theater. And um, artists have been on the right side of history in the struggle for freedom and the complex history uh, in the struggle for freedom and liberties that they have been on the right side of history. And I think they are again, and uh, they anticipate often uh, what will happen and are much more in the presence than perhaps we are. And with us, we have uh, one of the grand masters um, of American um, theater. If it would be chess, she would be a grand master uh, in the world. Um, it is the great Anne Bogart um, who for decades uh, has uh, worked in our field in our vineyard of theater and performance. Uh, she has dedicated her life to this art form. She has been highly influential. Her work has been thought provoking, beautiful. She found what we are looking for, new forms. Our motto a little bit is that what Brecht said, new times need new forms of theater. And she's someone who invented new forms. And uh, as Brecht said, we, he did the theater for the children of the technological age. Now we have the children of the digital age uh, coming up, uh, audiences, but also theater and performance makers, and also teaches at Columbia University. So she's even closer, perhaps, than many, many, many others, you know, to, to what's really uh, going on. And Anne, uh, really, thank you for taking the time to, to join us. Where it's are my you pleasure. Now? I'm, I'm in London, but before I tell you, I'll tell you that story, but I have to, and I think I'm probably at the right moment in the progress of the Siegel Talks that you started how many weeks ago? Uh, this is week nine, yeah. Week nine. I think it's about time for somebody to say, Frank, 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 are you okay? I mean, you, <laughs> yeah. are, you are on the front lines you are doing a service to the field that is extraordinary. I think these talks have taken on a, a sort of a snowball effect. I think they've become important to a lot of people. And I just wanna know, are you okay? Well, um, and thanks, thanks for, for asking. And uh, yes, you know, of course it's a, a serious engagement. Um, and perhaps a little bit bigger than I thought uh, when we started it and when Halloran said, okay, you really want to do this? And yes, and um, so, um, but um, I think it is um, a contribution we can make uh, through the history of the Siegel Theater to be, have a global network to think globally. I always think of Marvin Carlson's book, The Little History of Theater that goes around the globe, all countries, all continents. Uh, it's a beautiful small publication that teaches you something. And, um, and in that tradition, we, we, we do the work and uh, we think of our healthcare workers, how hard they work. We still, mm -hmm. I think I have it a very, very, very good, but it's a way to, to contribute. And I'm also really interested to hear from it. And I do know that it's important also for, for artists from other countries, you know, that they feel there is some kind of a connection, especially to the US that is such a island, yeah. big island, such a tunnel vision. So it's our little contribution. And we also really feel 
that this is, something is really wrong, something is going so wrong, and we as people from the theater, from the performance art, we have to be part of the change and, um, and we have to come up with new things. We will be different after this, and, uh, but I really don't know really. Um, do you, but, but you do it five, day, five days a week, right? Yes, yes. And do you spend a lot of time preparing? I do, I try to, you know, of course the mails, exchanges, but also to, yeah, to look up and think of yeah. it. So it's, uh, I try to do justice. You know, I'm, as I said to you earlier, I'm nervous. This is a great, and Bogart uh, who is here with us. And, um, and um, so we want to hear from you and I hope uh, it right. will be meaningful to, to you also. And, but I just want to say, and I, th I think I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of people is thank you for doing this. And I hope it really you means a lot to me. Yeah, it means a lot to me. I'm getting all verklempt here. I'm just very moved in this time. You know, it's hard to find action to take. And you either have to develop what Eugenia Barba called SOTS, which is the quality of space just before an action, which is more important than the action itself, but determines the quality of the action. But you are in a moment of, of action and that's that's to be commended. But But to answer your question, and not make it too much about mm. you because I can see that makes you slightly uncomfortable. Yes. <laughs> Little uh, <radishes. laughs> uh, But that's okay. But I hope you could feel the thanks because mm, I think it's you. from a lot of people. Um, I am in London. I came here on the 11th of March for a week with a small suitcase. And I came to see my wife. We, we straddle between New York and London. She's British. And at a certain point after living 12 years together in New York, we decided she missed New London and I love London. So we said, okay, we'll try to figure out how to straddle both cities. But I came here for a week and um, I've been here ever since because I don't want to get on an airplane. And uh, I'm really happy to be with my wife and our puppy, we have a puppy, mm. uh, a golden retriever puppy named Mabel who might end up bounding down here at some uh -huh. point. Um, uh, but what what was happening before I c arrived here for a week, expecting to come back, was that um, I had I had directed uh, Tristan and Isolde mm. in Rijeka in in Croatia on the Mediterranean, and just as we opened, there started to be stirrings in Italy about shutting down Italy, and there was stirrings about how to go on with an opera in its four performances. And then I came back to uh, New York to reunite with my students at Columbia and then flew immediately two days later to Minneapolis to rehearse and open our production of the Bacchae City Company at the Guthrie. Now, of course, we opened and it was supposed to have a six week run. And uh, what happened? Uh, the run was shut down, the theater was shut down. And it's been devastating to the Guthrie. I mean, I think the large theaters are suffering more than the small theaters. I think small theaters like City Company, you know, we're used to we could, we're used to being elastic and changing the number of people working in the office or what office you say at working from your home. Anyway, mm -hmm. so uh, and then suddenly Columbia shut down, and so uh, everything was shut down. So I've been spending sometimes up to seven hours a day on Zoom for three big parts of my life. One is City Company, which I'll come back to in a moment and tell you how we're functioning during this time, mm -hmm. because we're a company that will be in a year and a half, 30 years old, believe it or not. I never thought that would happen. Uh, also in terms of Columbia, dealing with the directing program and uh, teaching online, but also or on Zoom, also dealing with the the department and the university and the the medical field and how to move forward and how to plan for next year and all of the contradictions between wanting to uh, save the economy of Colombia and the, the country and also wanting to keep people safe. So that's been huge. And then the other thing is I'm on the executive board of SDC, the Stage mm -hmm. Directors and Choreographers Union, which is suddenly faced with of 1500 plus directors suddenly having no work for the foreseeable future. And I seem to be on a hundred committees, either co-chairing or on them. And we meet all the time trying to figure out how to move forward, how to be helpful to the constituency, trying to predict what's gonna happen, which no one can do because nobody can predict anything. Actually, we turn out to be as human beings, very faulty with prediction. 
So uh, this, is, this is where I am sitting in this little basement um, uh, uh, room in, in London, um, connecting. And I would say, you know, and I, I, I'm sure somebody else in your series has said this, but, you know, I think social distancing is really a misnomer. Physical distancing is, physical distancing is true. You and I are physically distanced. We are distanced from those who are listening to us. Mm -hmm. Socially, we have never been hotter. There is so much social interaction going on, so much people reaching out. And certainly one thing I found, and I'm, uh, it's sometimes quite depressing, but people show their true colors in a moment like this. I mean, you, Frank, in terms of what you've done, I, I always thought really well of you and, and respected you, but my respect for you has just gone through the roof because of how you act. It's in these moments of crisis and in these moments of, I love the French word, creux. it's like a gap. It's where everything mm -hmm. stops. Here we are. It's how you are, how you act, how you behave now matters. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to go to sleep now. And then when things are better, I'll do my best job. But actually, this is it. This is the moment when not only action, but preparation for action. You know, I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, I was very impressed by something that the um, Italian director who lives in Denmark, Eugenio Barba, um, uh, uh, asked the question, which is, what is it that all actors around the world have in common, even if they don't speak the same language, or once you move, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a cultural, gestures you have, but what is it you share in common? And his answer, and I think it's a Danish word, is sats, S-A-T-S. And that is the quality of energy in the moment before you move or before you act. And sats happens, I, I, I know nothing about archery, but I think about an archer. It's the, it's the moment before the release of the arrow that determines the success of the arrow. It's not whether you're Mm -hmm. aiming right. It's the quality of, of energy in that moment before. So a lot of us are in a state of sots in this moment, and we share that across the, around the world. And the quality and how we cultivate that sots will determine how we act when we can. And, and that's something that has been uh, occupying my thoughts a lot. The other is, and I'm going to say some things that might not be popular, but right after the shutdown occurred, um, you know this, and a lot of people got desperate and started doing what I would call self-expression online. You know, the coronavirus dances and the endless readings and like, let's keep putting it out, putting it out. And it was really bothering me. And I found it really solipsistic for a while. It seemed like display and I couldn't look at it and it was bugging me until finally my friend Tina Landau said on Zoom at one point, she said, you can't put that down. That's actually a form of mourning. That's how people are mourning their situation. And I said, you know what, you're right. But I still kept thinking about this notion of what's going on, whether it's display or something else. And I started thinking about a uh, prisoner of war, uh, prisoners of war in Vietnam or in the Second World War who were put into cells and they were not allowed to talk to each other. And they developed a very elaborate and secret method of tapping, either tapping on a pipe or tapping on the wall. And what was important in the tapping was not only the content, the information that was going from prisoner to prisoner, but also the sense of keeping spirits together. And so I thought there's a very different thing that's going on, which is about tapping. And we're on Zoom now. And one of the reasons I hold what you're doing in such high esteem is I feel it's a form of tapping. It's you saying, tap, 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 are you out there? Tap, 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 what do you have to say? And you listen back and something's happening. And I think it's a very different form of putting yourself online. It's either I just am desperate and I've got to uh, 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 put out stuff or I've got to show what I think. But the other thing which does interest me more, although I, I think Tina Landau was right when she said it's a form of mourning. That's what people are doing when they're dancing and singing whatever mm -hmm. online. 
okay. But the issue of how we learn to speak to one another. And I think when we come out of this, it's not gonna be easy and there will be a lot of changes. And Frank, did you grow, where did you grow up in Germany? Um, in West Germany, but close to the in border of the East, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking about also, how do you pronounce that word, Samizat? The, the, the uh, say it was what uh, Vaclav Havel would write books and it would be self-published and secretly sent around mm -hmm. from pe people to people. How do you yeah, they were illegally published magazines, yeah. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. we are gonna be dealing with something similar, not necessarily politically, but circumstantially that the way we relate to each other has got to change. And the, uh, the way we make theater will we, we'll probably have to change at least for a while. And so it behooves us to go back to what is fundamental in what we do, get rid of all of the noise around it and try to figure out. And I think one of the fundamental things about theater is that notion of tapping. Do you hear me? I hear you. You know, one of the most beautiful things I ever read in my entire life was in an interview with Alfred Brendel, the uh, great Beethoven pianist, who said mm -hmm. that he would be in concert and he would get, he'd be playing a Beethoven sonata and he would get to the moment before the final chord. And in concert, he lifts his hands and silently asks the audience how long they'll let him wait until he plays the final chord. And when I read that, I literally screamed. I said, that's it. That's the entire reason I'm in the theater is for that permission or that communication that goes on between the stage and the audience or however that's configured. And so this is another, another essential quality of the theater. And so uh, I, I have no idea where I'm going in this conversation, Frank. You, do you, I don't even remember what you asked. No, this is all very, very, very significant. <laughs> Please do, yeah. do go on. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, consequently, this is the time, as far as I'm concerned, to develop a very strong SOTS, which I think is a little bit like having the accelerator on and the brake on at the same time. And mm -hmm. so when we let the brake off, we've got, we've got our engines going and it, it takes a certain discipline. It takes a certain reserve, um, a certain containment. It's like taking a, a Pollock painting and put a frame around it. So we have Pollock feelings, but we have to actually put a frame around it, not repress and get sick from our anxiety, but actually have, have that full, uh, Panoply, panoply, what's the word? Pan, panoply of color yeah. and paint mm -hmm. and, and, and take care of it and, and preserve it and, and wait. And waiting is an art, as is listening. Listening is an art and waiting is an art. And these are things that we can cultivate for now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a this is this is a this is a very good reminder. You know, the moment before you do something, and this is now a long a moment we do experience. How how do you how are you as a person as and how do you experience the time? Well, you know, there's something. I think there was a book written about it called Micro Habits. I'm a person of micro habits, and I realize that it's helped me a lot in terms of this period of time. Sometimes I think it takes me half a day just to go through my little micro habits. I mean, I wake up in the morning, I drink my coffee, I write. Then I do Tai Chi, I meditate, I study whatever languages. Right now I'm studying two languages, one in the morning and one at night, which is really confusing because they're too close to each other. Uh, so I study Spanish in the morning and Italian at night, and it's completely confusing because they're so similar, but it's sort of fun to do. Um, and then we take our puppy for a, a walk in Kensington Gardens. And then I get on Zoom for about seven hours and uh, uh, spend a lot of time um, either with my students or with SDC. And, and now I'll get to the part about City Company, which I think might be interesting for yes. folks, which, mm -hmm. is, which is what we're doing in this period. Um, so when uh, the Bakai closed down in uh, in Minneapolis. It was supposed to have another four weeks or five week run, which was great for the actors, uh, uh, as they call it, a sit down. 
And then right after that, the company was supposed to go to Singapore to the festival to make a new play uh, uh, with a company there um, uh, of the Three Sisters. And then after that, we have Saratoga, which every month we do a four week intensive training. All of that gone. Certainly actor salaries, everything gone. And due to the brilliant um, machinations of our staff led by executive director, Michelle Preston, who very quietly went about finding ways for us to survive financially. And for, and it was very clear that what was most important were the actors, the people who were involved, that, the, the, that we had to take care of those people who had suddenly lost uh, work weeks, which means they lose health insurance. So through her brilliance, Michelle Preston and her staff, we have the actors are on salary through June for now through mm -hmm. June, which is great. And then we've been working through May and into June. Now, what we're doing, I think, is interesting and might be relevant to some people who are listening, which is a couple of years ago, maybe it was more than a couple of years ago, I had a conversation with Moises Kaufman and he said that he found it ridiculous that ensemble theater companies raised money for projects. And he thought, you know, if you were a painter, you don't raise money for a painting, you raise money for a studio where a lot of different paintings are being made. And so he was in the process of going to various foundations and funding agencies and saying, I think the way you think about funding ensemble companies should change. And I jumped on board immediately. It made so much sense to me. And so we at City Company changed the way we approached uh, funding and certain, and certain foundations went along with it. They got it. They said, fund, fund a, a, a studio rather than a project. NISCA went on board, NEA went on board, various foundations went on board. So what we had was something we called workspace. And workspace, is, is a little, if you think of like planes on the tarmac, mm -hmm. each plane is a project and various times one takes off. So we would be working on various projects. The actors are on salary, uh, equity actors on salary, and they, we work on various projects and at certain times of the year, the, the, the project takes off, takes off off the tarmac. So this is what we've been doing for a few years and we went right back to it when the COVID uh, crisis happened. We have something, we, we went back into workspace mode, but now we're workspace on Zoom. And so every day, as a matter of fact, uh, they're doing it right now because uh, I, I came here to speak with you and <laughs> it started you. at noon in New York. Um, and we are uh, doing a number of things that I think you might find interesting. One thing that we're doing is that for going on 30 years, the company has trained together. They do Suzuki training and viewpoints training together. And it's something that, you know, from the very beginning, the actors asked each other, what is it that makes us a city company actors? And they decided it's the training. It's the fact that we mm -hmm. train together. And, um, and so that's always been a basic uh, uh, core value. And also a way that the company has kept solvent over the years that they, is that all of the company members, all of the actors teach, they teach the training. And that is so that if they're not paid for being rehearsing or performing, they're also being paid for teaching. And we have a conservatory we've had for, I think, three or four years. We've had uh, ongoing seasonal training. And so suddenly we're confronted with problems on Zoom. We don't necessarily want to make Zoom product. That's not interesting because we're theater people who are interested in that moment when Alfred Brendel talks about that quality between the audience and the, uh, and the actors. How do we use Zoom during this, this time or whatever platform we end up using um, to continue training? And so what we decided is that each of the actors each day, it's five days a week, would lead the training as they would in the studio usually, in, the, uh, in, in our own studio, uh, but that we would try to figure out how to do it on Zoom. And this is, the actors are really far away. Here comes the puppy. Come on up here. Come on up here. Come say hello. Oh, oh, oh. oh look, look at the kid. 
<laughs> Mabel. Come on, Mabel. Oh. There's Mabel. Say Beautiful. hello over here. That's Frank over there. <laughs> it's great to have a puppy in this time. It's amazing. Yeah, it's important. It, it connects us to nature and life. It does. And the animal and she's world. Always, mm -hmm. She's always present every moment. Mm -hmm. She's, oh, over here, over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She came That's to say true. hello. She's it's, a great yeah. reminder. I think it was, who was it? Maya Holdorf Achtangov said, you have to watch cats and dogs. Every movement is perfect. Right. And balanced, yeah. nothing yeah. superficial. Nothing it's they true. don't have to do, you know, nothing for show. It's just to do. Well, that's the, that's the basis of the, the Kleist uh, essay towards a marionette theater, that yeah. marionettes aren't self-conscious yeah. and, and uh, animals aren't self-conscious either. And that's the problem every actor has anyway. Anyway, that was Mabel. She's now leaving. Uh -huh. That was enough. Um, uh, uh, so uh, each actor in City Company leads a half an hour training. And it's at moments awkward because here we are in all these different windows and people are in their damn living rooms and they feel ridiculous and embarrassed. And at one point, you know, uh, Kelly Marr would say, I, I'm stomping on my carpet. I feel so dumb. And so it's felt very, very awkward. And so they do Suzuki training and a little bit of viewpoint training, but the, each actor has to innovate how to do it with each other on Zoom. And they come up with insane ideas. But the point is, is that they're trying. And there are every once in a while, there's a sliver where you say, oh, I feel that tapping on the window, or I feel that sense of what Alfred Brendel's talking about. Tiny little hints. And I think that's what we're gonna have to go through a little bit too, is the awkwardness when we can leave our homes and we start venturing out into places where other people might be dangerous, might make you sick, you know, what does that mean? So anyway, we do that training for a half an hour every day. And then we've been working on old repertoire, but then the last two weeks we've been reading mm -hmm. very seriously and very deep reading together. It's kind of table work of Thornton Wilder's Skin of Our Teeth, which we have mm -hmm. never done before. And is the most extraordinary play in this moment. And of mm -hmm. course, we all have the appetite to do it now, is to do a big production of it however one can, because it, the content of it is essentially the content we're living through now. And it is prescient and strange. And, you know, and a lot of people accused mm -hmm. Thornton Wilder of stealing from James Joyce's Finnegan Wake. There's things lifted from it. And as uh, even, even Joseph Campbell, of all people, accused Thornton Wilder of lifting Mm -hmm. chunks of Finnegan's Wake and, and, and Thornton Wilder said, uh, yeah, and I hope that somebody lifts from me, you know, 50 mm -hmm. years from now. You're right, he was deeply influenced, and, but yeah. Yeah. He was shocked so, when he read Finnegan's Wake, yeah. He reacted to it, as you said, you know. Yeah, and it became part of him. I always love, who is that rock and roll singer, I'll think of his name in a minute, who said that whatever he hears, he thinks he owns. And I love that. I mean, you can get litigation forever on that, but he feels that whatever he hears, he owns, mm -hmm. uh, is, is fascinating. Anyway, so we're trying. And so mm -hmm. City Company will, through the month of June, be on salary, having um, uh, uh, health insurance. And uh, after that, we, don't, we haven't figured that out yet, but uh, we're working on it. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you deal with it, having all that responsibility for your company, your students? being part of the council of the directors. Um, I'm, you know, I'm really, great, I'm really grateful for it. And you might feel that a little bit too, Frank, um, in terms of what you're doing. I remember right after 9-11, I was asked to give a speech at the uh, APAP mm -hmm. opening ceremonies. I was very, very flattered that after 9-11, they would ask me to give the big opening plenary speech. And what I realized in preparing for it is that I was jealous of all the people who had to figure out how to put things back together again after 9-11. People who had to get the newspapers out and people who had to get the stock market back up and running. Well, that was part of the problem, but we won't go into that. Um, people who had, who had jobs to do. Now it's a little different here because now people who have jobs to do are, are probably the most endangered people 
the ones who are going to work every day are, are, are endangered. But, but um, I'm grateful for the responsibility for the students. I'm grateful to be part of the family of SDC, Stage Directors and Choreographers Union. And I'm grateful to be part of a company that's survived all these years going on 30. I have no idea how we did that. We didn't mm -hmm. start That's out that way. Remarkable in America. Remarkable. I know. We started out thinking, oh, 10 years max, but uh, something happened. It was a good chemistry. Mm -hmm. So being together now, it doesn't feel so much as responsibility. It feels like a necessity, as does the other work. It feels mm -hmm. the students need attention, you know, and that's another one of the you know, I was mentioning before that what we need to find out was what are the essential ingredients of the theater, get rid of all the other stuff around it, figure that out. And one of the things, the essential ingredients is attention and the quality of attention, that you, you pay attention to what people who had things to say and they died and never finished their question, their, 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 their sentences. And our job in the theater is to remember those people, to put them back together again attention to Thornton Wilder, who's not there, you know, attention to the issues. And I remember driving in the car once uh, in a snowstorm and I heard, I was listening to a sermon because it was the only um, station I could get. And it was, and the, the, the uh, priest, whatever you call him, the minister said, describe the etymology of the word Episcopalian. I grew up Episcopalian, so I listened. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's episcope, which means to look over, episcope. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's what we do in the theater too. It's a kind of episcope is we, we are attending to issues. We put our attention on something. And as quantum physics taught us, the act of attending to something changes it or the observer created reality. So that's another mm -hmm. fundamental part of what it is that we do. So paying attention is a big deal and that's also a kind of responsibility. So when you ask me about feeling responsible, yes, but it's a, um, it's an, uh, it's a, uh, it's, it's a, I'm grateful to be, to be responsible uh, to others. Yeah. It's a, I can only imagine, you know, how, um, how, um, how that must feel to that and what you do then also really, it really, really has, consequences it does but I, yeah what was that film there were two films actually um one was called up in smoke who was the filmmaker who found a cigar store or a little convenience store on a corner in queens maybe and he decided it was such an interesting little store that he would um shoot a film there it was an in jamosh i'm not sure I don't think it was Jaramush, it was somebody yeah. else. And then the actors had so much fun doing it, they decided to use the rest of the stock to make another film, which was then called Blue or Smoke or something. But, and I, I remember mm -hmm. seeing both those films, it was a while back, but the idea of saying that store is interesting. And suddenly that's in a sense, our job is to be curious and then to respond to something, to be a barometer to the world to see what creates resonance in us. And we have to pay attention to that. So now we're in, a, in, a, in, an, in an arena that we really don't know about. We don't have control over. We are recognizing our own basic state of uncertainty, which is actually more true than any sense of certainty. And so what we do have is we have the barometer of our body and our interest, and we have to pay attention to what's happening and then go there when we get what the French call a frisson de corps, you know, a, a goosebumps. We have to mm -hmm. pay attention to what's giving us um, goosebumps and we'll, we'll make discoveries that way. We cannot predict the right actions. You know, when I think of my company trying to do training on Zoom and it is embarrassing at moments and humiliating, but that trying is like being in a, in a dark time tunnel and, and trying to find a little bit of light. So that's where we are. We're, we're again, tapping 
on the walls to one another and listening for a response. Mm -hmm. in, in the tunnel and looking for, for a light. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a beautiful image. Um, I think once Olympia Dukakis came to the Siegel for what I forget exactly what it was about, but um, and she said the reasons she was doing theater are no longer the reason why she started. How is it with you? Is is it reinforcing this moment? Why you when you started when you wanted to do theater? What did what did Olympia Dukakis say? I'm very interested. I just adore her. Yeah, if I understood right, she said the reasons why I started theater are no longer the reasons why she does theater now. Something has changed, ah, but she still yeah, does yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, how is that for you in this moment? Are you, are, you, um, are you doing the theater for the same reasons? Are they different? Have you learned something? Or is this is something moving, changing? Well, I think I originally got into the theater because I was so angry. I was angry at my family and I was angry at the world. I thought things were very unfair for women. And in the theater, I found a place of grace where, and perhaps I could say a place that as a director, I could control. Although the older I get, I realize I, I don't control anything, but and, and I learned through doing the theater that what our job is, is to build ideal communities that we believe in. And I'm a, I, I to this day believe in, and nothing that I say is, uh, is original, and this is certainly not original, the notion of revolutions in small rooms. And that I, I don't think that um, say a chorus line would have happened if Joe Chaikin and the Open Theater hadn't done their work. And I'm sure Michael Bennett went and saw it and said, oh. And so in these small rooms of the Open Theater where they created a new kind of dramaturgy that had to do with the people in the room, it was brand new. I think that a chorus line came into the world and then spread out into the world. So we create certain social systems in, in, the, um, in the room that we're in. But I also, if you, and, and this is, I'm gonna get around to answering your question because my, the answer is gonna be, it's the same. But what I understood is, meaning my reason for doing the theater is the same now as it was. Uh, but if you look at what the difference between the theater and all other art forms is, the theater is the only art form whose subject is always, how are we getting along? And how can we get along better? So every play that has any <clears throat> value is about a social system that's screwed up. You know, a guy kills his father, sleeps as his mother, and Thebes is a mess. And you watch these characters try to find harmony from a state of dissonance. And that makes a great play. That's called a tragedy. That's fantastic. But Death of a Salesman is the same thing. A family is screwed up, a state of imbalance. And you try to find a group of people and individuals trying to find balance in a state of imbalance and uh, and, a state, and in, in, a, in a, a compromised situation. So that each play asks the question, how are we as a community and how can we be better? So it, it is about social systems. Dance isn't, visual arts isn't, architecture isn't, the theater is about how are we getting along. But what became clear to me is that it's not only how the characters in a play are getting along, but it's also how the actors are getting along. I mean, if you've ever seen a play, you probably know, I mean, if you, you, you can look at the stage and know how the rehearsal process was by how the actors are together. And, um, and the, the audience feels that. And if you can create a social system that proposes a different way that a, that a, a, a uh, a society might exist in that small room, you're starting to change the culture around you. That's why it's a revolution in small rooms. So it's not only how are the, audi the actors getting along, it's how are the, uh, is the audience getting along? And I hate to quote David Mamet because I hate to quote David Mamet, but he said, the audience learns from one another how to watch a play. But it's not only how is the audience getting along and how are the actors getting along, it's how are the actors and the audience getting along together. That's one of the major questions. 
So what I learned is that when an audience goes to see a theater, a play, they're actually seeing two plays simultaneously. One that they're receiving in the prefrontal cortex of the brain, which is about, oh, if they left the theater, they say, somebody said, what was it about? So, oh, it's a guy about, about a guy who killed his father and slept with his mother and Thebes was a mess. That's one play. The other play that they're taking in in a more ancient part of the brain is how these actors were getting along, how they function together. The actors together are proposing a way that human beings might be together. You know, when I originally heard about the, um, when, when the uh, Stanislavski's Moscow Art Theater came to the United States in 1922, 23, um, and, and all these young people went to the theater and they were so blown away by what they were seeing, I used to think, oh, it was the, it, it, they were blown away by this technique of acting that Stanislavski had started with his company. But I realized later when I read deeper and saw that, oh, well, they begged some of the actors in the company to stay and teach them how to do it, like Boleslavski, you know, various people in the company. And it became their misunderstanding of Stanislavski became the religion upon which our, our theater in the States is founded. Uh, and, it's a problem, we won't go there right now. But what I realized is that what they were inspired by was not a way of acting or a technique of acting. They had never seen people be together that way before. Mm -hmm. Because until the Moscow Art Theater came, you know, for money, because it was after the Russian Revolution and they were they were broke, but they came to the States. Uh, until the Moscow Art Theater came, what you were looking at through either melodrama or vaudeville or fake English Shakespeare was this, the kind of lead singer in the backup band. It was very, very hierarchical. And so uh, these young people who were in their 20s now, whose names were people like Lee Strasberg or Harold Clurman or Stella Adler or, you know, Joan uh, uh, Crawf uh, Crawford, uh, uh, not Joan Crawford, Cheryl Crawford. Um, these young people were had actually never seen people be that way together. And that was what was inspiring. And so you look at what was going on with Stanislavski in those moments. He actually brought older pieces of work to the States that he had done in like 19, before the revolution, Chekhov and Gorky. But he had been influenced by the latest breakthroughs in science, in art, in psychology. He was influenced by Pavlov and later Freud. He was influenced by uh, Heisenberg, uh, influenced by the uh, uh, notion of an observer created reality, uh, reality the uh, uncertainty principle. He was influenced by uh, uh, Picasso and Brock, the whole birth of cubism. And so what you do in the theater is you say, look at all these breakthroughs that have happened, how do you apply that to us living together? How do you take cubism and use those breakthroughs, those understandings in art or in science in the uncertainty principle or with Freud or with Einstein with special relativity or with Eisenstein in montage theory? I mean, all these people and you translate it into the question that we're dealing with is how do we get along? How can we get along better? So his approaches to acting and how an ensemble worked was a response to all of those amazing breakthroughs. Now, one of the reasons that I think say the viewpoints, which I did not invent, Mary Overly invented, I get accused quite often of having invented it. I think one of the reasons it's been so popular in the, in the States and in the world is because when people experience it either as audience or in it, they are experiencing a different kind of um, uh, uh, way of getting along. And I, I remember uh, years ago, I was doing a, a workshop in, um, in uh, North Carolina with, um, with uh, graduate students and actors um, and professional actors. And uh, at the time I was very interested in neuroscience and I wanted to make a play about neuroscience. I was interested in studying it. And a friend of mine who was there in Chapel Hill said, oh, I know a neuroscientist, would you like to meet him? And I said, what's his name? And, and, and she said, his name is R. Grant Steen. I said, oh my God, I'm reading his book. It's about physics, 
uh, neuroscience and how it, people like me can understand it. Anyway, we went for dinner and I was very impressed to be with this uh, Dr. Steen. And at the end of it, I asked him if he wanted to come see a viewpoint session. Uh, we were doing a sort of final, I was doing a 10 day workshop with students and with actors and we were gonna do a final open showing. And he said, sure, I don't go to the theater much but I'd love to go. So he came and we had a talk back at the end of it and he raised his hand immediately. And I said, yes, Dr. Steen, he said, what I just saw in an open viewpoints improvisation is how we've learned the brain works. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the way information is, is, uh, is communicated, you know, there's no central force in the brain. The way the synaptic mm -hmm. activity works, the way information is passed. What I was seeing on stage is how the brain works. And I understood then that that's why it's become such a popular phenomenon because people are looking at it and saying, Oh, I get about how to be together vis-a-vis -vis the breakthroughs in the internet, in, in, in string theory, you know, in, in all of the technologies and the art that we're experiencing. The theater says, oh, well, then how do we translate that into how we get along and how we might get along better? So to answer your question, it's a very long way of answering your question. I'm still dedicated to making theater that actually has presence, that has... Um, force that is uh, is something you have to deal with and with it it is a proposal of ways of being in the world together ideally we work on it say city company in a, in a room in a studio and that that uh, that the work in that studio of creating an ideal social system will actually bleed out into the rest of the world and have an effect so you work hard in your studio not just because you're only interested in, in the studio, you're interested in making something that has enough resonance that it might actually spread out in, into the world. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, yeah, it's no, the I'll, same. I'll how do we get along and how can we get along better? And when I said I was angry as a young person, I was angry about you know, being a girl. There was just no career path in the theater for a young director. I was angry at my parents, I was angry, you know, I sometimes joke that the first half of my career is based on anger against my parents and the second half of my career is based against anger against the critics, you know. Anger is really wonderful, it's exhilarating if you don't let it kill you. It's a, it's a great source of energy. So great, great motivator, it's the yeah. same, yeah, it's the same. But what a beautiful uh, statement to say theater is looking at how the brain works and what happens on stage it's yeah. by doing, by moving, you're yeah. thinking, you know, you're in yeah. art. That's why theater is an art form and not um, entertainment. I think Olympia Dukakis perhaps also referred to that she had the great whole theater in Montclair, um, which she ran for a long time and she had to give it up. It was not possible in that smaller town. So even, you know, for you, uh, one more um, congratulation of keeping a company together. And the Moscow Art Theater, one of the reasons maybe also was Nobody had seen an ensemble that trained 10 years together as an ensemble. Yeah. Yeah. And then they did some, they build on some of the idea also what you, what you, yeah. um, what you champion. So um, let's say your, your answer or one of your answers or formal inventions or going back to great traditions like the ensemble was to build that ensemble, be together. Um, is that something you would say uh, is the thing to do now at, in that time or, or after Kona? What do you think would work from your vast experience? You have directed so much, created so much, you have seen so much, you have taught generations. So what do you think works? What should people be doing? Well, you know, I've always hated, there's two terms that I hate in the theater. One is I hate the term experimental theater. I just think it's the worst term ever because What's not Why? experimental? Because it, it, it tends to classify a certain kind of genre into a very small mm -hmm. container. And, and I don't like the, I don't think the word is very pretty. I just don't mm -hmm. like it. And the other <laughs> phrase I hate, and the Australians use it a lot, is physical theater. Like physical, I do physical theater. I'm like, what theater isn't physical? Sorry. But I would go back to the word experiment and I would say, I do know that as we come out, we have to experiment again. I, don't, I hope we don't call it experimental theater. I think we have to experiment with space and time 
we have to experiment with how we can be together in a good way, how we can be a model society, you know, and, and, and it behooves us to study the past. What was the book you mentioned, the small book, the small theater history of the world? A short, yeah, uh, I think it's called a, a short history of theater, yeah. I have to look that one up. Yeah. It behooves us to say, what is every audience actor relationship that has existed in the history of the world? Mm -hmm. You know, do you say it started in a circle and then somebody stepped out of the circle? You know, or do you, do you look at, at different um, theater architecture around the world or, or, or so it's, it's an experimentation that's founded in, in study, in research, in remembering, in trying things out as much as I'm watching the actors in, in City Company right now, trying their best. And I think we'll make a lot of mistakes, but if we go back and just try to do what we were doing before, and I think a lot of your guests have been very eloquent about why we shouldn't do that because the world is, is falling apart and for reasons we, we need to re-examine. So I think in the theater, we just have to uh, re-look at how we work. You know, I remember Bob Brustein said something, um, the brilliant Robert Brustein, founder mm -hmm. of Yale Rep and ART said a long time ago, he said, for the theater, you need three things. You need passion, you need technique and you need something to say. And when he said that, I said, that's so right. It's like, I think of a milking stool, you know, that if one of those mm -hmm. is missing, the whole thing falls down. If you don't have something mm -hmm. to say, it doesn't matter about your technique. It doesn't matter about your passion. It has no there there as Gertrude Stein said about Oakland, California. It's, it's not gonna work. And I think what we are gonna have to look at is technique because we don't have the techniques to handle the world we're about to walk into. So we're gonna to have to invent them. And I always remember a story, you know, I'm a big fan of Martha Graham and, and her mythology, but I remember um, when she left uh, Ruth St. Dennis and as a young woman, she studied with Ruth St. Dennis and Ted Sean in, in Santa Barbara, came to New York to start on her own. She got some dancers and then she wrote to Ruth St. Dennis and De Ted Sean and said, great, I've worked with you. I want to use your techniques to teach in New York so I can make a living. And they wrote back and said, uh, for a price. She didn't have the money. So she had to make up what became the Martha Graham technique. <laughs> and the dancers had to wait for her to come up with it. And they didn't show, know that she was Martha Graham. You know, They'd say things like, she'd say to them, don't count. They go, wait, if we count, we can get together. No, don't count. You know, so... Mm -hmm. That kind of experimentation, if you think of Martha Graham as a young woman, alone or not alone, with her, her women dancers waiting for her to come up with something, yeah. that's where we're at. That's what true. I mean, she, she, she said that famous, I think, oh, beautiful sentence, uh, I don't look for movements, movements come to me. Yeah. You know? So you have to receive them. You have to be open to them. So we have to go out wide open, determined, just angry enough to keep us going. And I would use that word experiment with hesitation because I don't like the mm -hmm. word so much, but uh, I think we are gonna have to experiment a lot, which is kind of exciting. We're gonna have to innovate. Mm. And, and as you said, be open to a failure, right? That it might not work Guaranteed. Out. Guaranteed, it's gonna it's gonna happen. You know, uh, I don't remember which of Martha Graham's work it was. It was a very early one, and people hadn't seen her concerts. And, and she got it. She she wanted the women to enter on stage, I think from stage left in a line. That's all. Just slowly come in in a line, and the dancers kept saying, "Martha, if we counted, we could step together." And she kept saying, don't count, don't count. We counted. I remember reading this in Agnes DeMille's gorgeous book about, which is the one to read about Martha Graham's life. Um, and, and so opening night came, small theater concert. And everybody who was in the room said they will never forget that line of women walking on in silence together. Like what it was. It was ancient. It was... It was revelatory because of the difficulties they went through in the rehearsal. They didn't count. 
what does it mean if you're not counting together? How do you, how do you relate? You know, it's again going back to tapping on the wall. Are you there? Are you stepping? Where are you? It go, goes back again to sots. You have to develop this quality of the moment before an action, which determines the success of an action. Yeah. So to your question, I'd say experiment. Mm -hmm. And, and to, to really experiment in the way we, I mean, we are also, you are the universities where in physics, experiment goes wrong is valuable, right? Because you know, that doesn't work. Yeah. It's important. I just, yeah, I just heard yesterday, actually, uh, some of my students who are MFA directors going into their third year, they told me about a, a, a confab of MFA directors who all got together on Zoom to talk and wonderful idea, whoever set it up from the different graduate schools to talk about how they're doing. And the question came up, how are your different departments dealing with this new situation? And a lot of the programs, they said, were turning to film. They were gonna offer the directors film training, which I think is great, but it's not what I'm gonna do with Columbia, with Brian Kulik, who's my fellow uh, di mm -hmm. directing teacher, is not turn to film, is we're going to experiment. We're gonna think of this as a lab time, a time to discover. To, to look at what the obstacles are and the restrictions are, and through those restrictions, create our own samizat, however you say that word, you know, mm -hmm. publish our own material that, that might show some discoveries and go through that discomfort. I don't think we will turn to film. Mm -hmm. I hope we learn from the technologies. We're certainly learning a lot through the platforms that include Zoom about how to use technology. So I'm not saying be a Luddite at all, I'm saying, theater. Mm. Yeah, also the film and television uh, artists, they have, they know what to do for a screen, you know, that's been there for decades, yeah, right? Yeah. Century. Yeah. And we are in a different, uh, in a different realm. And uh, so what, uh, what exercises do you do? If you share, what, what do you do then if it's your students on Zoom? What do you? Well, uh, I've decided that this coming fall, which will probably be a great deal on Zoom, for the incoming directors, the first years who are coming in, uh, usually they have to make work right away and make two fully staged short pieces a week, one for Brian and one for me. Brian and I have discovered, have, have decided to make the first semester highly rigorous academic um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm my own uh, graduate training was, I got an MA from NYU in what's now called performance studies. Back then it was called theater history and criticism or something. And I, that was the most important studies that I did as a director because I, because of the, 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 the kind of teaching that was happening there then with Richard Schechner, who I know was on your program and, and Ted Hoffman, you know, the, uh, and Michael Kirby at the time, it was all about the anthropology and sociology of theater. And that foundation was the best director training I could get. So we're going to, in the fall semester, really, really lean in hard on history. I'm going to teach for the first time in my life a class called History of Directing, which um, uh, is a challenge. Uh, and then in the second semester, assuming that we'll be able to make things, they'll make things all semester. So that we usually, Brian and I take, you know, the two years of classes and do a lot of academic work, sort of salt and peppered into the, their, their making. But since due to the situation, you know, the directors joked, and I thought it was very funny when this first happened, they said, what are we going to do with puppets? It's going to puppets on tables on Zoom. Is that what we're going to do? And I don't think that's necessarily the way to go. So I think we're going to really get into a deep sort of performance studies for, for the first uh, semester until we are safe to be uh, closer to each other. How, how, how interesting. And uh, if this is the moment before they launch their career, before the arrow goes out in the world, yes. so it's a different attention and there will be, yeah. it, that's a real change, I think. Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a change. Mm -hmm. And yeah. It's definitely a change, but I think I think it's the right decision, because uh, because you have to look at the tools you have, the circumstances you're in, and try to uh, try to light lights inside of 
young directors, you know, you can always tell when it's resonating with them because they get a little misty eyed, you know, when they get excited. Mm -hmm. You have to do it through Zoom for now. And that's, that's again, experimental, so. Yeah, it, it basically runs against all what we believe in and how we have trained, but yet it's a, it's a, a new uh, modern media and Rancière, the French philosopher said, yeah. you know, when a traditional thousand year old form comes together with a new technology, something happens and we'll see. Um, Where did Rancière really... say that? That's, I'd like to, to read around that. What, yeah, I once heard a beautiful books. talk of it. It was called kind of an archeology, span he called it of modernity and the, mm. the, 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 the lines uh, that go back instead of thinking it in a linear way, he said it's, these are all circles. And as you said, what is avant-garde? Most probably someone in a Greek chorus, one person step one step ahead out of it and yeah. said something. And people yeah. were, said, that's incredible. You know, yeah. someone yeah. said something, not in a court, but on his own. And then a second person stepped out and yeah. said something. And people said, yeah. that's amazing. And then the two talked to each other. So um, yeah, but um, they are, they are, um, and connected. Or even the idea was that. you could hear it, you know, that the acoustics got yeah. better and you could hear what they said, you know, it, and a technical architectural invention, you know. But even before that, which I find amazing, is that they, there they were in um, uh, uh, doing these rituals on their own in the dithyramb. There was nobody watching. Who said suddenly, oh, let's people, let people in to watch us? There's another one. You know, because mm -hmm. the, the original in Greek, those Greek dithyrams were done without an audience. Mm -hmm. What suddenly led, oh, we'll do it on this hillside so they could sit there and watch us. That's, yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah. And I think it is, in a way, it is a time and uh, as Athens, you know, uh, or Black Athens, as Richard uh, taught us and uh, referred to it, uh, which was both closer to Africa than we all think. Yeah. Um, but um, what does it mean for, say, what would it mean for New York City is to celebrate life? to understand who we are. I think you once said that beautiful quote from Sanskrit, you know, theater is about where do we come from? You know, mm -hmm. where are we now? Where are we going? And you have to entertain the drunk, if I remember right, you know. Uh, oh, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah it was, the, yeah, exactly. It's, it's one, you, it, what, theater has to do three things. One, you have to answer the question, how does the universe work? Mm -hmm. Two, it has to answer the question, how to live? And three, it has to entertain the drunk all at the same time. It's yeah. so great. I'm so glad you remembered that. Yeah, it's another milking, uh, milking, yeah. milking, uh, milking slope. But do you feel that this time, even so, if I understand right, you really, really are working so hard as always, but do you feel inside you a change? Are you looking at the world differently? Yeah. And, you know, uh, I, I did a couple of days ago, I did a the uh, West Coast LA Directors Lab Zoom session. At the end of it, they said, um, uh, the, what have you learned? Or what advice would you give? And what came out of my mouth was, slow the fuck down. And then uh, Randy Travitz, who had asked me the question said, oh, I'm printing the, that t-shirt right now. And that's what I've learned is to slow the fuck down. Slow the fuck down. You know, we've been going faster and faster and faster over the last number of decades. You know, I remember trying to deal with like, what, what do we do as theater directors during MTV? Remember MTV? It's like, do we go faster than MTV? But then the internet is twice as fast as that. Like what are, uh, it's become uh, to a point of speed where in the theater, changing the time signature be has become the most radical thing you could possibly do is to change the time signature of living. And so I thought I was doing that. I thought I was pretty slow inside, but the, in terms of your question, what have I learned is to slow the fuck down, slow down, slow down. And I hope I don't forget that, you know, I hope, I hope that's a, a change that has resonance and effect over time. Sometimes, and this is the worst thing to say because I don't really mean it, sometimes I think we need to be in this longer because if we get out of it too fast, we just go back to our old habits. I don't mean that because I'm thinking of the cost of on so many lives right now, but I do mm -hmm. think that I'm scared that we will forget so fast 
the lessons of this time. Hmm. Is there something what you wish, or you say in New York, let's talk about New York City, our city, but what should change that would make it better right away? Is there something, or do you, what do you dream well, about that's also it's, possible? It's, it's, it's already changed. Um, and, you know, it, it, a couple of years ago, I was talking to some undergrad uh, new school students, and there was a young man, undergrad, I was talking about politics, and he said, oh, you know, you should use the term intentional civics. I said, what? Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, I've been thinking about this thing called intentional civics. It turns out he made it up. I've looked for this term. And it means that the quality of the, the, the intentional civics is paying attention to the space in between people, not the people themselves. In other words, rather than dealing with psychologies, you deal with the quality of space between people, you take care of that space. Now, in our current moment, the space between us has become very, very alive and very dangerous. And, and we have the, the option of either doing what that horrible woman in Central Park did yesterday, where she called on a Sure. African-American, I know, man and said, there's an African-American tr trying to um, threaten, me, yeah. me, threaten me, which I would call not civic, uh, uh, civic attention, I'd call it, I'd call it civic abuse. But uh, intentional civics is to, to say that my job as a human being is to take care of the space between me and other people. It's something that certainly the viewpoints is about. And it's one reason I've loved working with that is that what we need to do as we go back out is not to be abusive to one another, but take responsibility, not for each other's psychologies or fears or what have you, but take care of that space. And if we can, I mean, you're talking to a girl who was at Woodstock for three days. So I'm, I'm a little, mm -hmm. an old hippie in that way, but, but there was something really extraordinary happening in those, at that time, uh, and, and if we can heighten our attention to civic, to, to, to the civics, the intentional civics of our, of our space, I think we might uh, discover many new things. And that I'm talking about New York City. Mm -hmm. And that's already there. We already have the space between us has become more alive. We're moving in a different way. How do we develop that? Can we develop it with a, a, a intentional civics that we intentionally take care of the people around us, the space around us? Can we move together more gracefully? Hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's um, something that's, that is possible and thinkable, right? And it doesn't need any big millions of dollars and it's, um, and awareness, as you say, it, what Theodore yeah, teaches you us. Yeah. Change, your, change your mind a little bit. Change how you think about being in the world. Think more horizontally rather than vertically. Because mm -hmm. in the horizontal is the social system. We tend to think vertically. You know, we come from, in the United States anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a culture based on violence and cowboys, you know, and it's very vertical. But there's another thing that happens horizontally, which I hope we will accentuate. Mm. Yeah, and that perhaps in this time, really, uh, people also, in a way, do realize the, 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 the fast uh, velocity that uh, stands in the way of us also be leading better lives, being better human beings and enjoying yeah. Um, um, and, yeah. Um, our our time, our community, our cities, that's something we are actually missing. And um... that's so right, Frank. It's really about savoring, isn't it? Like that's if we're moving at a certain pace, we don't savor. I remember if you've ever been injured or something, like I remember when there's like different tempe on the streets of New York. I found mm -hmm. when I've been injured or I can't work, walk so fast, there's a whole nother realm of people who are going slow. And you never see them when you're going fast. And you just get into a different space and suddenly there's blurs of people going by and there's a whole nother world that's living underneath mm -hmm. that time. But I, I think you're absolutely right. I think celebrate, you use that word and, and, and I would add savor, taste, 
uh, I would think, um, you know, in a, in a Virginia Woolf sense, moments of being, enjoy being together. Yeah. 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 What do you think about writing? Will there be a new writing coming out? So what's writing are you interested in at the moment or what are you, what are you looking at? Have you, there's a, there's a really, really wonderful book, which actually Rachel Chafkin told me about and then, or she mentioned it and I got it, which is The Overstory by Richard Powers. I don't really read uh, fiction much, but it's mm -hmm. doing something very interesting, which is it's, as you read it, you realize it's about trees. It's not about humans. And it's, again, it's a way of changing the dramaturgy of, um, of our, of the way we, receive the world. There's another um, a book called Dostoevsky Red Hegel and Bursts into Tears. It's by um, a uh, Hungarian and it's about essentially how the enlightenment screwed us, that we became so involved in thinking that we could conquer everything. I'm talking about the enlightenment of the 18th century and that we're getting to a point where actually we, um, we're not in charge. There's a, a new book uh, by somebody uh, named Lewis Hyde who wrote The Gift, which is called the Pri A Primer for Forgetting. It's a, it's a gorgeous book. Um, uh, I'm having fun with um, Just for Fun, which is Parisian Lives by Deirdre Bear, who wrote, wrote about writing about Beckett, writing the biographies of Beckett and Simone de Beauvoir. Mm -hmm. um, and these are, I guess these are most of what I described is slightly different kind of dramaturgy is like taking, you know, who are those photographers who, who suddenly um, started taking pictures from a greater distance than usual. So you start seeing the architecture of the world. Mm, Thomas Struth, like that German school. Uh, yeah, of exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah. So I think yeah. there's writers who are doing that. Um, certainly. Uh, and if I could get off Zoom enough, I have a book, I'm writing a book myself, which is due to the publishers by the end of the summer. And it's called The mm. Art of Resonance. And what so, is that about? Tell us a bit. Well, you know, I, I, I used to think that the most important thing in the theater was the theater. I would say if, if the theater were a verb, it would be to remember, to put things back together again, to remember. And a friend of mine who's a, a city company member and also co-artistic director, Leon Inglesrud, said to me that his, his mother has Alzheimer's. And he said, what about people who can't remember? Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's interesting. What is it that we do in the theater? And I started coming to the word resonance, that we create resonance. Like there's times when I'll read a book and then I forget what it was, but I realize, and I think, how could I read a book and forget what it is? What's the point of reading it? But I realized that while I was reading it, something happened to me. Something started to resonate, to resound. And so the notion of creating resonance is at the core of what we do. It's like a tuning fork, you know, on the stage, we set up something and in the audience, it resonates. So that, the, 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 or even, you know, just, just two weeks ago, I was doing some writing and I always give Rena, my wife, the first read and she read it and she was like, she gave me some critique and I went back. I was so angry because she wasn't excited by everything. I thought she hated it. So I tried to write it some more and I realized that it simply didn't resonate with her. She didn't, mm -hmm. she did, she didn't read it and have something that, that, that made it go farther. And I realized it wasn't she being too critical of my work. It was just, she didn't resonate with it. And I realized if we don't create resonance in the world, there's no point, which is why going back to the beginning of our talk, I had so much trouble with self-display on the internet when the COVID crisis started. It's like, that's mm -hmm. not about creating resonance. 
it's creating resonances where there's something happens and then it causes something else to reverberate, which causes something else so that you start a resonance. You can't control where it's going to go in the world. So I'm trying to write a book of essays uh, around that subject. Um, so it's hmm. called The Art of Resonance. When you were that young, angry, um, I don't want to hold you up too long for your time, but when you were the young, okay. angry uh, um, um, young woman, what did you see in Cedar? What, what was the moment, what, did, what, what you saw or what you said, I'm going to do Cedar? What was that that resonated well, so strongly? Th there were two, two big things that happened. Well, three, actually. One was, uh, you know, my, my family's in the Navy. Every, on all sides, it's always been Navy for many, many generations. As a matter of fact, my great, 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 great grandfather was captain of the Minutemen. You know, during the really, season. yeah, it's that mm -hmm. military. My grandfather, my mother's father, was in charge of the Pacific Fleet during the Second World War. His name was Admiral Spruance, and he was a very quiet man, but and he was known for winning the Battle of Midway. You know, he was a strategist, and he used to go to sleep in the middle of battles, and uh, people would come to his door and say, "Admiral, Admiral, this submarine is sunk." Why, uh, what should we do? And he'd say, why'd you wake me up? And they'd say, but Admiral, the, the submarine was sunk by the Japanese. And he'd say, well, you know what to do. We've gone over it. He was a great strategist. His gift was strategy. It was not, it was, unlike MacArthur who would restage battles to show how great he was. My grandfather would say, there's no room for photographers on the flag, flagship. He was anti-PR. And I always related to him because it's like, you don't stop a play in the middle of the play and say, director, what should we do? It's not working. It's the same idea. We worked it out. It's strategy. So for me, the, 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 the directing is strategy and creating a world in which other people can make that strategy work. But to answer your question, so we moved every year or two. Longest place I ever lived as a kid was in Japan for two and a half years. And when I was six years old, the ancient uh, resonance happened, the, the, the fear that came up when I saw some of the um, uh, huge uh, uh, puppets and, um, and, and costumes on outdoor festivals in the streets of Tokyo terrified me. And it was a terror that, you know, all theater is based in terror. And it awoke in me a fear and a, a desire to get closer at the same time. And then moving from school to school, I was always dumped into these big stupid schools. And I always find a little place where they were doing plays. I never wanted to act in them, but I was you know, running around backstage and helping out. And in Rhode Island, when I was 15, I saw my first professional production and it was directed by Adrian Hall. And I was one of the school kids was he, he, Adrian Hall went to the NEA and asked for a million dollars, 1967, when I first saw the play, a million dollars was like 150 billion to bring every school kid in Rhode Island to see theater. I'd never seen professional theater. And it was the Scottish play. And I sat there as a kid in the theater. It was directed by Adrian Hall. It was designed by Eugene Lee. I didn't know all these things at the time. I was just 15. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand a word because it was Shakespeare. The witches were coming out of the ceiling. The actors were 360 degrees around and Adrian and his company didn't try to dumb it down at all. They didn't take that million dollars from the NEA and do kids schlock. They did complex, complicated, scary, terrifying theater. And I sat in that theater with like the thousand other kids and I said, that's it. That's what I want to do, whatever that is. And it was my first lesson as a director because I didn't understand anything. I'd never heard Shakespeare before. I didn't know what they were talking about. And I, the lesson was, and I didn't meet Adrian Hall until um, 20 years later when I became the second artistic director of Trinity Rep, which is where it happened in Rhode Island. That's another story. But um, what I learned from him as a 15 year old is don't talk down to your audiences because I realized that theater isn't about understanding. I didn't understand anything, but it was about taking my 15 year old sensibilities and bringing it to a thing I didn't understand. And that space between me and it, which is unfamiliar, 
is the reason that I stayed in the theater or wanted to be a director. And that's, that's you know, I pointed in the Wittgensteinian said, if you can't say it, point to it. I pointed at the stage and said, my whole being said, that's it. That's what I'm gonna do. That was the formidable, and there was no going back. And I've never done anything since. I'm such a loser. I only direct this. <laughs> no, you went very, very deep as a, as I have said, as a hedgehog, but also as a fox, you cover a lot of field or as a rabbit, he said, you know, you have to combine both uh, <laughs> yeah. things. This is um, what, what makes it, um, what makes it, makes it different. Yeah, this is um, an, an, an incredible time. And sure, also you would spending yeah. time with your wife together for such a yeah. long time. And the puppy. And the puppy and you're, you're in London, you're away from yeah. New York. Listen, thank you really, really for, um, for, for sharing and for... Um, thank you, and I will reiterate what I said in the beginning mm. and thanking you for doing this series. I think it's yeah. very important and uh, I and hope I really, you um, feel that. that. That really, really means the world to me. I also know that Great. you mean that and uh, yeah. that's even more more significant as a, as a closing. And you've talked a little bit, but what in the essence for your Columbia students, for young artists uh, everywhere, also maybe for our listeners, um, again, what do you feel, how, how is that time where we really do not know how it will end or maybe it will open up and it will close again, nobody knows. But what do you feel is the real, is the significant thing we should take with us? You know, what, what who is your? Well, you know, it's, I remember, and you spoke with Richard Foreman recently. I remember he came to speak to my students and he said two things that shocked me coming from him. One is um, he said, and you know how intelligent and heady he is. Mm -hmm. He said, the only thing you have going for you in rehearsal is your intuition. There's nothing else, no amount of reading. And I thought, boy, if Richard Foreman is saying that it's gotta be true. And the other thing he said when, um, and a, a, a director asked for advice. He said something that I cannot ever top and I feel it's the answer to your question, but I will attribute it to Richard Foreman. He said, courage, that's it. Mm. And I think courage and intuition would be the ingredients that we need to cultivate. Yeah. Well, this is, um something we really should listen carefully to, to be to have the courage yeah. to use our intuition yeah. to think about the space between us yeah. you know and where we go out to create things that resonate yeah. in the sense of what you said that something happens you know when you read a book and you're already reading a word you have to do some work right they says tree but you have to imagine it and you have to make a decision you know what does yeah. it mean which tree is it and i think this, this, this work that it's about us that we have to participate and that we have to be active and that yeah. we have, as you pointed out, we have to think of the bigger picture. It's no longer good enough yeah. um, to, 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 to be of yours. So uh, they will be, will be really, really interesting. And one of your students, um, Ashley Kelly Tata, I think to, to again, she will do the, uh, the Mad Forest. I think it's a- um, I I'm gonna watch it away. tonight, yeah. yeah. Three o'clock New York time, so I get to see it in London because it'll be for the new city. Yeah, so to, it's one of the I think, theater for uh, new audience, not theater for new audience. audience. Yeah, sorry, yeah. theater for the new audience. I'm a big difference, and yeah. um, and um, you know, so she's trying. I think the rehearsals were interrupted. Yeah, and as a good student of yours, she did not stop, as you said, and she tried to adopt it right for yeah. a Zoom. So it will yeah. be interesting. I heard about it. our I students. Can't, I can't wait to see it. And I've had emails from people who didn't know she was my student saying, oh my God, you have to see this. I was in tears. I'm so, so, I'm so excited. Yeah. See what so about. let's see. There are some things, things are out there, things as we talk yeah. are changing, maybe already have changed. And it will also reinforce, you know, what we have, yeah. but also cite something new. Yeah. And will grow. I, I said that earlier. I think the um, that that great German poet Hölderlin, who I admire very much, who said, "If if there is danger, that what saves us also grows." Yeah. In the time we might not see it, but it's growing. And I hope this is um, and something in theater, you know, and you and everybody in working on it. You know, as you point out, how significant that is. That to observe and changing while observing and participate mm -hmm. as audience member. We need great audiences too. 
and we do have them and that um, we actually are part of um, that world and uh, our participation is of significance ultimately all about us are you listeners at home now yeah. and people in the audience people on the stage and that they we are connected in a mysterious way i'm also so, so glad you brought yeah. up holderlin which is somebody mm -hmm. holderlin should be more known in the state so keep talking about holderlin okay i will and i thank you for bringing up kleist you know that's also in his marionette theater that's a, yeah an important uh, contribution. Well, so there's really, another mm -hmm. book that he wrote that we should all read in this period, which is very important. It's called, or it's not a book, it's maybe an essay called On the Formulation of Thought Through Speaking, yeah. which is, yeah. I think, profound. Profound. He talks to his sister, right, who said, who he claimed oh, yeah. she doesn't understand, but something becomes clear while he explains yeah. to him. Well, it was a bit misogynist. He said, you talk to dogs or women, you'll figure it out. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. But look beyond that. There's look something beyond that. Yeah, say. yeah. That's what he was uh, was trying to say. And I think he yeah. admired her very much and was the most fondest next to Charlotte, yeah. or perhaps the most closest to him. So really, really thank you. Tomorrow we have uh, Patricia Cornelius from Australia, a playwright. Also, you know, as an experience like yours, uh, she has done uh, many, many great works for the Australian theater and try to put find language and stage and place to to, to reflect uh, on on the Australian society. And um, and Hoi Fa Wu from uh, Hong Kong uh, is with us on Thursday. Carol Martins suggested him to come on to really, really talk about life, art, making it there, but during the virus, but also now with this new uh, laws that are being proposed or uh, imposed, better to say, by China. Let what will what's what's the situation for artists there? We had also artists, you know, in, from the Ukraine who say, you know, the coronavirus. This is a holiday for us, it's like Christmas, we, the war is stopping, you know, so uh, we are enjoying this, you know, and the devastating accounts we heard from Brazil and uh, the complications in Hungary, Poland, and in Egypt and Lebanon. So it's a really, it's a worldwide crisis and the theater um, is deeply, deeply infected as everybody else, but artists are more vulnerable. And they do need encouragement, as you also said, and that they are such a significant uh, a part. And we uh, perhaps also don't see that in the fast pace we all move, that artists really, really do need support. They support us. So what you do is great with your union and with your students and your company. So uh, we look up to you. You are a role model. And really, thank you for sharing that, that moment uh, in time. Thanks to HowlRound for hosting us. As I maybe didn't fully know what we got into, as well as for Halron, didn't fully believe it, but it would happen. It's a lot of work for them. So thanks to Thea Travis and uh, VJ, the Siegel team, San Yang and Andy, everybody. And I hope you will uh, join us tomorrow. We hope the Odin Theater will be with us. You know, to, to, we should hear from Eugenio Barba, also Tadashi Suzuki and many, many others who are waiting to hear from. So, um, so um, we'll, um, we'll go on and try to make our contribution. And, keep on knocking. I love that idea of the little knocks and uh, the communication. So thank you. Thank you, Anne, for thank everything you, and uh, all the good energy and forces. And that, you know, that, that time also, you know, will uh, keep the bow uh, uh, working. There is the Japanese haiku also that says, a bow of an arrow that's always under tension will not shoot. Mm. You know, it will get weak. It needs to rest. So perhaps Great. there's also- well said. Yeah. It's a little bit of time. So thank you again. And thanks to our audience. Really, thank you for taking the time out of your busy day. We all know how much we all have. So it means a lot for us that you do listen and that you carry the words with you. It's ultimately also about you, the listener. It's not really about us. So um, it is important to have audiences, importance to process the thinking like in literature, perhaps as the French philosophers taught us. It's not really about the writer anymore. It is what you think, how you interpret it, how you make connection, how you put this together. And the same is with theater work and others. It's how you see it, how you connect it, how you uh, make uh, uh, new um, combinations of signs and interpret it in the imagination and the symbolic, but also in the real way. And this is the work of the audience. It's fun and it's great. And theater artists work so hard. So it's a fantastic thing to be able just to come and see and think about it. So, and thank you for uh, being in the little bunker there uh, in London, uh, in the underground, as you said, um, who knows who is sitting there if it's an old house, you know, what, what time happened before you, mm -hmm. ghosts are surrounding you. So um, thank you again and uh, 
I hope you all stay safe and stay tuned to us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye and thank you.